Good day, everybody. Thank you and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tsetseba Loi. I'm the Communications Officer for Southwest. I will be quickly introducing today's speaker. Today's speaker is Prof. Lucia Anelich. Prof. Lucia Anelich has over 40 years experience in food microbiology and food safety and is owner of her own successful food safety consulting and training business. Prior to starting her own business, she established the Food Safety Initiative at the Consumer Goods Council of South Africa. She also spent 25 years at Swan University of Technology, where she was head of department and associate professor. Most importantly, she is the only person in South Africa and Africa to be a member of the internationally renowned expert group of microbiology for, of food called the International Commission of the Microbiological Specifications for Foods. For more information, you are welcome to visit her website where she, where a snapshot of her accomplishments can be downloaded. Professor Annelich has been president of Safost for over four years, and she is now serving on the Safost Council. Prof. Lucia Annelich, over to you. Thank you, Tsetse, very much for that kind introduction. And good afternoon to everyone who is online participating in this webinar. We have a varied audience uh, in this webinar, including journalists, consumers, and a number of people from different sectors of the food industry. Therefore, I have kept the presentation rather broad, but I do hone into some advice for the food industry later on in the presentation. Still so much is unknown about this virus, um, and literally we are learning more and more about it on a daily basis. So I have endeavoured to keep uh, this presentation as current as possible, but new information, as I've mentioned, uh, accumulates on a daily basis. It is inevitable, therefore, that over time, information may change. To mitigate this, I shall be providing names of organisations and or links to those websites where information is updated closer to real time. I shall be placing these on my website at www.analegeconsulting.co.za. In addition, um, material that does not belong to me that I am referring to in this presentation is obviously not copyrighted. I cannot claim copyright on that. But any other information that comes from me that is included in this webinar, including the infographics and the posters on advice for food workers that I will refer to later on are copyrighted to me and I would appreciate it if you would respect that copyright so that if you use that information or if you refer to it that you will then give due reference to myself or and or my company. Before we continue with the presentation uh, one very important announcement and that is a salute to the food industry. I would like to salute absolutely everyone from the farmer through to all the different service providers that we just accept are there, but they are in the background and we often don't know or think about them at a particular time, to the retailers, the wholesalers, the transportation system, the distribution uh, systems as well. All of you, I salute you for ensuring that we have a continued supply of food. In addition, I want to have a shout out to all the medical professionals uh, at all levels who are at the cold face of this pandemic. They put themselves at risk to help patients through, hopefully, to come out on the other side of this dreadful disease. And so many of these medical professionals are themselves becoming ill and many of them die as well. So a great shout out to them too. The presentation will therefore co cover the background to this virus, symptoms, transmission, survival, as well as survival on surfaces, uh, anything related to food safety, how to minimize transmission between particularly food workers. We've heard a lot about flattening the curve, and I would like to refer to that using uh, an image. And then I have some added information on wearing masks. So this virus that we now call the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus um, is really uh, a cousin, if you like, of two previous viruses that we've seen, 
that are coronaviruses that we believe jumped from animals to humans. The first one popped up in 2003. It caused an outbreak uh, and it originated in China as well. It was called the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And then the second one uh, was in 2012 and it affected mainly the Middle East countries and it was given the name Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. The second one was far more limited, but it did have a much, much higher death rate than the original SARS virus. This one had a death rate of about 10%, whereas MERS only had about 2,500 cases, but the death rate ran at 34%, which is incredibly high. The current coronavirus outbreak is being caused by what we now know as the SARS-CoV-2, and we call it COV-2 to distinguish it from the very first one, which is actually now called COV-1. And in the rest of the presentation, I might be referring to the coronavirus from time to time. When I do, I shall be then referring actually to the current SARS virus. And as you know, this caused the beginning of what we now have a pandemic and it, uh, originated in China in 2019. The disease it causes is COVID-19 and the virus has what we call a lipid envelope, which is essentially a fatty layer around the virus. And I'll speak to that a little later. But the one thing I want to put out there right at the beginning of this presentation is that this is essentially a respiratory illness. The typical symptoms are fever, cough, and shortness of breath. There are other symptoms that people can uh, experience, such as a sore throat from time to time. They might actually experience fatigue and even muscle aches and pains. In very, very few cases, some people have diarrhea. And when it gets really bad, you have near, more severe symptoms such as pneumonia, and then people start to gasp for breath as their airways become incredibly congested. Currently, transmission is via person to person, via touching each other, shaking hands, hugging, kissing, and so on, and also via droplets from coughing or sneezing. And this occurs particularly within a two meter distance. You'll notice that these two points are highlighted, whereas the third one, namely contaminated surfaces, is not highlighted. There are some public health authorities that are starting to believe that, in fact, contaminated surfaces may not be one of the major ways of transmission. Regardless of that, we do know that contaminated surfaces can actually uh, cause transmission. So it is important that we do take this under consideration and that we then decontaminate or sanitize surfaces both at home and in the food industry as regularly as possible. And that is why we talk about the social distancing of two meters as a minimum in order to prevent cop droplets from coughing in particular from spreading to pers from person to person. The incubation period is currently two to 14 days and there is international consensus on this. The median is about five days and if one is to get severely ill, it should show up by day eight. By day 13, anyone who will have symptoms will usually show up those symptoms by that day. There is no current cure for this virus or for the illness that it causes, so treatment is mainly supportive. There are numerous clinical trials going on, not only for a vaccine. Uh, that, in, in terms of a vaccine, they've already done quite a few animal trials, and so human trials should start around about September. Uh, but nevertheless, we are looking at about 12 to 18 months before we actually have a viable vaccine. A lot of uh, work is being done on repurposing various drugs. One of them is the anti-malaria drug, and there's a lot of controversy around it at the moment, with um, some medical people believing that it's too early to actually administer this drug to people because we don't know any side effects it might have, at what dosages should we be giving it to people. Uh, we just don't have that information yet. And yet there are some countries that are proposing that this anti-malaria drug is in fact administered to these patients. There's no doubt that the virus is highly infectious. 
children seem to have milder symptoms than older adults and the elderly and people with underlying health conditions are more prone to severe symptoms and even death and when we speak of underlying conditions we talk about things like diabetes cardiovascular disease people who are undergoing cancer treatment people with um, high blood pressure and many others yes some children are dying and it is certainly a, a, a big concern but uh, because in many cases we don't know why they are dying because they shouldn't be uh, according to all the statistics but we also have to remember that this disease is not a zero risk disease and so the number of young people and children that will die will be far far fewer than those who are more prone and more vulnerable to this illness what is of great concern is the asymptomatic individuals we believe that this is actually quite a high percentage of people they show no symptoms whatsoever uh, but they are spreading the virus. And so that is one of the reasons why the World Health Organization has been encouraging countries to test, test, and test, because we need to actually understand not only who is positive for the virus when they are showing symptoms, but more importantly, those who are positive for the virus, but they are not showing symptoms. So in South Africa and Africa, we have some other challenges that might be slightly unique. For example, in South Africa, we have a 20% HIV positive population. These people might be at greater risk. Those who have tuberculosis, those who have malaria, and even people who are undernourished as well as overnourished. Undernourished is understandable because people's uh, immune systems will be affected if they don't have proper nourishment. People who are overnourished also run at a certain risk because even though they might be overweight or obese and are ingesting a lot of calories, those calories might not be representing proper nutrition. There are also people in other countries in Africa who have underlying conditions and who are not being adequately treated simply because the treatment is not available. And this could also cause greater vulnerability amongst those populations. We've seen in South Africa for weeks now this issue around social distancing in informal settlements. It is an enormous challenge for us, especially where people are six to eight in a room. For them to maintain social distancing is really going to be extremely difficult. And in many, many uh, communities, we do not have running water. So we are teaching people and encouraging hand washing very, very frequently. But it's going to be really difficult for those who do not have running water. Government is providing water via tankards in these communities, but nevertheless, accessibility to that water can also be quite difficult. A lot of questions are asked around whether this coronavirus is airborne. The World Health Organization in this respect have come out with three statements, which I'm going to go through. The first one, the coronavirus can go airborne, staying suspended in air, depending on factors such as heat and humidity. And these two factors are really very important. But they also say of specific importance, this aerosol that could be uh, in the environment is of greater importance to medical staff where aerosol generating procedures occur as in medical care facilities. What has been found is that where patients are positive and on um, ventilators in hospital. Viruses are found on the linen, around those patients, in curtaining, and so on. So if these materials are taken and shaken, then it could potentially create this aerosol of the virus. It is therefore really important then that these people wear specific masks, like these N95 masks, because they filter out around 95% of all liquid or airborne particles. So yes, it can be airborne, but it is of greater importance to the medical staff because of these various procedures that they might be undertaking. Professor Anton Stoltz, who is the head of Department of Adult Infectious Diseases at the University of Pretoria, has put out a YouTube um, in which he is interviewed. It is a 37 minute long interview, but it is really excellent. And I would like to encourage everyone to go and use this 
uh, URL and actually follow and listen to that full interview. He puts this illness in really great perspective in a very calm and professional manner. And he agrees, in fact, that this virus is partially airborne, especially considering we have to keep in mind that coughing can spread the virus for up to two meters, Sneezing can spread it even further up to six meters. But the beauty, I suppose, on one end is that this disease, COVID-19, coughing is far more common than sneezing. So the chances of having spread of the virus uh, to these distances uh, are very, very remote. So the two meter social distancing is what is being promoted, encouraged, and hopefully practiced as well. In terms of survival of the virus on surfaces, there is an article that was published in the New England Medical Journal, and this is the DOI reference for that article. It's called Aerosol and Surface Stability of the SARS-CoV-2 as compared with SARS-CoV-1. And in this article and experiments that were conducted, they found that the, the virus could be in aerosol for as long as three hours, and it could be viable for that period of time. Bearing in mind that the duration of the experiment was only three hours and it was conducted at 65% humidity and at a temperature of 21 to 23 degrees Celsius. So this viability in aerosol may change depending on any changes in the humidity or the heat of the environment. And then they found that the virus could be viable on copper for up to four hours, up to 24 hours on cardboard and up to three days, 72 hours, in other words, on plastic and stainless steel. And these three latter experiments were conducted at 40% humidity and at 21 to 23 degrees Celsius. And again, these times could change depending on any changes of humidity and temperature. Let's take a step back and have a look at how viruses actually replicate. This is mainly for people who are not in this field. Viruses do not grow outside of their hosts. They need a living host in which to replicate. So the viruses that affect plants will need a specific plant in order to replicate. The same applies for viruses that infect animals, viruses that infect humans, and there are also viruses that infect bacteria. And we give them the special name bacteriophages. And in this particular case, and in the case of the SARS-CoV-1 virus and the MERS viruses, we do believe in all cases that those viruses were in fact in animals. And it's been proven that these coronaviruses are in animals quite prevalent in a variety of different animals. And in some cases, these viruses then jump host from animal to human. They mutate in such a way that they are then able to infect humans, whereas before they were unable to do so. So therefore, these viruses cannot grow on surfaces and they also cannot grow on or in food, whereas bacteria can. And therein lies the main difference between the two in terms of food and surfaces. So these viruses can therefore land on surfaces via coughing or sneezing. And in the case of uh, foodborne viruses in particular via fecal contamination. And typically this is when people have a foodborne infection, they might have diarrhea, they go to the toilet and then leave the bathroom without washing hands after visiting the toilet and return to working with food. In that way, they can actually transmit the virus to food and other people then eat the food without necessarily cooking it or uh, heating it further if it's not designed to be so before they eat it and so they can actually get ill. We also know with uh, vomiting in terms of uh, foodborne viruses like the norovirus and if any of you have had the norovirus infection you may have also experienced some vomiting. We know that the droplets of vomiting once they hit the floor they can actually aer aerosolize and so be transmitted to other people or other food in the environment and people can then get ill from those aerosolized particles. So how does this SARS-CoV-2 virus multiply? Well, it is an RNA virus 
And this RNA, which is its nucleic acid, uh, lives or is protected within a protein capsule, which is a spherical capsule in this case, and is covered in these so-called protein spikes, as you can see in the picture. These spikes identify receptors on the surface of specific cells in the lungs. These receptors are called ACE2 receptors. Once it locks onto those receptors, the virus breaks into the cell effectively and then hijacks the lung cell's machinery to produce only new virus particles. So the lung cell stops doing the work it needs to do to keep the human body healthy and is hijacked to produce only these new virus particles. At some point, that lung cell dies and hundreds of new virus particles are released that are distributed then further into the human body to then attack other cells. So in 30, on the 30th of January, 2020, um, I put out my first communique to the food industry. This is long before the virus arrived in South Africa. Bearing in mind, we had our first coronavirus case on the 5th of March, 2020. But I started to put out uh, some information for the food industry in order to prepare them for when the virus would in fact affect our country. And in that communique, I did pose the question, can the 2019 novel coronavirus be transmitted via food? This is the name that was temporarily given to this virus before it actually had the new name SARS-CoV-2. And at the time, I added the answer simply that we do not have clear evidence that the 2019 novel coronavirus is in fact transmitted via food and nothing has changed. We now have very little evidence still that the COVID-19 virus is transmitted to humans via food or indeed food packaging. It is therefore not regarded as a foodborne virus as we regard the norovirus or in fact hepatitis A and some other viruses that can be transmitted via food. It is essentially a respiratory illness and a number of various agencies across the world are in full agreement. Namely, the FDA as an example, the United States Department of Agriculture, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the European Food Safety Authority, the Food Standards Agency of the UK, the Food Safety Australia New Zealand body. Uh, you can even go to the Canadian government website, as well as the Food Safety Authority of Ireland, and you will see similar conclusions. So one of the questions that can then be asked is if some patients have diarrhea, can this virus be transmitted via the fecal oral route? Well, two studies have been conducted that describe the cultivation of the virus from stool samples. But even so, there has been no case of fecal oral transmission of this virus that has been reported. Therefore, the conclusion is that this route of transmission is highly unlikely. Then questions have been asked around, if we cook food, can we in fact kill the virus? We do not have data on this particular virus currently, but what happens in these cases is we look at similar viruses and we have data for those. In this case, similar viruses would be other coronaviruses and the first SARS-CoV-1. And we do know that for those, uh, in particular the SARS-CoV-1, 60 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes in a protein-containing environment which reflects a food uh, is actually effective to kill it. And so the French authorities have conducted uh, quite an intensive investigation and have done an expert consultation. And they have worked on the potential of killing this new virus. And they have come up with 63 degrees Celsius for four minutes of cooking that would be considered effective to even kill the new SARS COVID 2 virus. And this is based again on reflection of previous viruses and how cooking affected them. It is also highly likely that this virus will survive refrigeration and freezing. 
We do say for all other foodborne viruses that are not related to this one at all, because we know that this one is not foodborne, that freezing does not kill. So freezing can never be regarded as a kill step for viruses in food. So it is highly likely, therefore, that this virus will act just in a similar manner as others and be able to survive refrigeration and freezing. Work has been done on veterinary COVID viruses and found that these do survive refrigeration at four degrees Celsius for over 28 days, whereas at room temperature, that uh, survival period is much, much less. And this work was conducted by Kampf et al. this year. One can also ask the question, what about infected food handlers? Can they possibly transmit the virus to food? Well, of course, it is acknowledged that this could become a mode of contaminating foods, particularly by symptomatic people, but hopefully by the time one has determined that they are symptomatic, they will have been removed from circulation and from handling food. But it's the asymptomatic individuals that of course we don't know who they are because they're not showing symptoms, but they are able to transmit the virus. Those ones are of a greater concern. However, coming back to the French authorities and that expert consultation that was done, there is still no evidence that a person can, in fact, become infected through eating contaminated food via the digestive tract, keeping in mind that this is a respiratory illness and via respiratory exposure while eating food. In other words, while I'm masticating food, is there a possibility that I could be breathing in the virus at the same time? And according to these French authorities and an excellent consultation that they have conducted, they have found that no evidence exists for this mode of transmission. So in conclusion, in a food manufacturing environment and even in a food retail sector for that matter, the greatest risk remains transmission from person to person. And that is what we need to be looking out for. So in food businesses, the majority have a food safety management system in place. This food safety management system can be um, rather basic or it could be really, really sophisticated. Either way, they are all based on good hygiene practices as a bare minimum. And it is a good time now to reinforce those good hygiene practices. And for those who are participating um, in the webinar who are not from the food industry, this has been done for many, many decades. Uh, the food industry has been teaching um, workers to wash their hands really, really well with soap and water for 20 seconds. And we've been teaching them to do this by singing happy birthday twice. So this is nothing new to the food industry. It's just a really, really good time to reinforce this excellent behavior. And in high risk environments where a food is going to be packaged, that is not going to be cooked by the consumer further or heated by the consumer before consumption. There is an added step that is required in the food industry and that is after washing hands of soap and water to then sanitize hands with a minimum of a 60% alcohol hand sanitizer. So yes, these have been in place for a long time. Uh, amongst other good hygiene practices are for example, do not cough or sneeze or spit in the food environment and so on, and there's many others. So good time to go back to these and make sure that they are being well practiced. In this regard, I put out advice for food workers. It's an A4 infographic over a two page, uh, over two pages, and then an A3 poster, which you can download for free, either one of the two at my website. And I have a number of do's and don'ts that are reflected in this infographic. The good news is that on Monday, I shall have the Zulu translation available. It will also be loaded on the website that you can download for free. Um, you will just have to enter your name and your email address and submit the form, and these will then become available to you. So when it comes to cleaning and disinfection, Let's first get back to that point that the coronavirus has this fatty layer or lipid envelope. And in this picture, you can see it quite clearly. On the inside, 
you've got the RNA of the of the virus, and then you've got this lipid envelope, which is the fatty layer, before you get the protein spikes. And um, this fatty layer is in fact, in, in a sense, a blessing in disguise, because that means that this virus is incredibly susceptible to many chemicals that are currently being used in the food industry. If this were not the case, it would be a far more difficult virus to get rid of um, in, in, a, in a surface situation. And the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States has published a list of chemicals that work against this virus. And this list is called List N, which you can then find off the internet. Other work that's been done in the past by Comfort Al have found that 70% uh, alcohol works for a minute of exposure. 0.5% hydrogen peroxide also works at a one minute exposure or contact time. And then a 0.1% sodium hypochlorite solution works very well also for a one minute contact time. And this is nothing less than diluted household bleach. In South Africa, our bleach concentration that we purchase off the shelves runs at, I think, 3.5%. Um, and then you just need to do a slight calculation to work out how much do you need to dilute it to actually get to a 0.1% solution that you can then use quite effectively. The CDC in the United States proposes also a 70% minimum ethanol concentration if you are going to use ethanol to disinfect surfaces. And they also are in agreement that a one minute exposure time is necessary. So in terms of examples for the food industry to minimize transmission to other people, this is not a comprehensive list. You are welcome to contact me directly if you wish assistance with a, a more comprehensive list. But in this respect, certainly one can clean and disinfect food contact surfaces extremely well. Um, clean them also more frequently than what is currently the case. Clean and disinfect common touch points more frequently. This is the, these are areas that people are prone to touch more commonly, such as door handles, countertops, step balustrades. Um, don't forget the canteens people go in, they touch refrigerator doors, they touch microwave doors, taps, etc. Locker rooms, computer keyboards, registers in retail sectors, and so on and so forth. And if possible, increase the number of hand washing stations, even if they are temporarily set up. Install more hand sanitizer stations and make them easily accessible to people. Encourage more frequent hand washing and sanitizing of hands. And then for retailers, and you could put out a number of policies for protecting shoppers as well as workers. And amongst these are, for example, sanitizers at the entrance, and sanitizer wipes for trolleys, have some aisle procedures in place to encourage social distancing of at least two meters. Some retailers are only allowing a certain number of shoppers to enter at a time into a store, yet others have set aside special times for pensioners and the elderly to be able to do their shopping so that they are not exposed to younger people who might be carrying the virus. And then yet others are actually now taking temperatures of each and every individual that actually walks into the store and prevents them from entering the store if they are, fev if they are showing a fever. In other words, if their temperatures are, are higher than normal. Practice social distancing in your food environment wherever practically possible. But we do acknowledge that in some cases it may not be fully possible. In these cases, the employers should be a little creative and consider what other measures they could put in place to protect food handlers. When workers are reporting for work, try and minimize contact between shifts and stagger break times. In other words, fewer people in canteens at any one time, because this really does help the people in the canteen to keep a social distance of two meters. And um, identify hotspots. I've had a few things coming into my inbox, what about this or what about that? And one of them was, what about breathalyzers? Many large manufacturers, even small ones for that matter, have breathalyzers at the entrance to their premises 
that both visitors, contractors, as well as workers have to breathe into to determine whether they have been consuming alcohol before they have stepped onto these sites. Um, and this is important from an occupational health and safety perspective. So the question now becomes is, if the previous person has breathed into this breathalyzer and had coronavirus, could it be aerosolized when the second person comes along and breathes into this breathalyzer? And could the second person possibly pick up some infection? Um, so the question a lot of these manufacturers uh, would have to ask is then, do I continue to use these breathalyzers? Can I effectively sanitize them in between people using them? Uh, and if not, am I going to purchase a different kind that I can sanitize or do I not use them during this period uh, because of the high risk that they might pose? So this is something certainly worth investigating for the individual companies. Some companies are installing thermoscans. Just a word of caution on the thermoscan because fever is not always present in the first few days of infection. And then you've got the asymptomatics who may not show a fever, but they are in fact infectious. You do need to have a business continuity plan in, in place, as well as a communication policy, a procedure and content because your communication content to internal people will most likely differ quite significantly to external people, including your customers as well as your suppliers. And in fact, even if you are communicating with government authorities, do plan when an infected worker is identified in your plant, not if, because I do believe it will only be a question of when. And then for your visitors and external contractors that come to your plant from time to time, you do have a normal questionnaire in place. This might be the time to actually have a more in-depth questionnaire asking different questions perhaps. You might want to put them through the thermoscan as well and do a full wellness check if you are going to allow them on site. And in some cases, if you don't have these resources, you might consider a full restriction or ban during the COVID-19 time. Those of you who have labor brokers might sit with a bigger challenge because in these cases, workers come to your plant, they work for two weeks and then they leave. And you have a new cohort of uh, workers coming in and then you are always training and retraining and starting the training again from scratch. So embedding these concepts of washing hands and all the other good uh, hygiene practices rather uh, can be rather difficult. So perhaps this is the time when you should be having a discussion with those labor brokers and try and establish a more consistent workforce on, in your plant. I mentioned flattening the curve and I've taken Iceland as an example because I find the curve they have put out there really, really easy to understand. So Iceland at the time of putting out this curve, which was about 10 days ago, were here during their epidemic. They might be slightly higher. I do believe we might be actually also um, around this point over here. So the point with flattening the curve is not to follow the blue curve, which typically occurs in an epidemic when no action is taken. In other words, if this is where your healthcare system capacity is, at this dotted line, without any action being taken, you will very, very quickly exceed the capacity of that healthcare system and overwhelm it. And we've seen this in Italy and in Spain and in some other countries. So where we would ideally like to be is with the orange curve. And this is where action is taken quite early during an epidemic or a pandemic. And this is why our president has announced the lockdown uh, on the, uh, with effect taking effect on the 27th of March for a 21 day period until the 16th of April as a minimum. It is likely that it will be extended though, depending on how well we are doing in, term of, in terms of case numbers and in terms of deaths. If we see that these are dropping, there might be some relaxation in those measures. 
Um, and so this is typically where we would like to be as South Africa. And of course, many other countries would also like to follow the orange curve so that the healthcare system can handle the numbers that are going to be admitted to hospital that have to be intubated or have to be put on ventilators. And then there's been a question over the past few days around masks. Should people be wearing masks or not in the food industry or else, elsewhere? So there was an article that was published in 2015 where the authors conducted a cluster randomized trial of cloth masks compared with medical masks in healthcare workers. And these are the conclusions they came to. The results caution against the use of cloth masks, number one. Secondly, they say, moisture retention, reuse of cloth masks and poor filtration may result in an increased risk of infection. And I think these are really important conclusions that we must consider when we think about whether we should be wearing masks or whether our people in our food premises should be wearing masks. The World Health Organization also published a guidance, an interim guidance on the 19th of March 2020, which is more recent than the previous article that I mentioned. And they say wearing medical masks when not indicated may result in unnecessary costs and procurement burdens and create a false sense of security. Now that is actually quite key. That can lead to the neglect of other essential measures such as hand hygiene practices. Further, using a mask incorrectly may hamper its effectiveness in reducing the risk of transmission. And by this they mean not using proper hand hygiene measures when taking off the mask, putting it back on, removing it to eat, putting it back on, etc. That can actually hamper its effectiveness even further. And so a medical mask is not required for people who are not sick, as there is no evidence of its usefulness in protecting them. And that is also a concern, namely social distancing. If people wear medical masks or just normal cloth masks out in uh, the public, they tend to forget about social distancing. They believe that because they are wearing a mask, they no longer need to keep the two meter social distance. And this is also a big, big concern. And therefore, again, these masks are not um, encouraged in terms of wearing them outside in a normal public setting or in food premises. Lastly, I would like to just alert everyone to a lot of fake news that is going around, drinking warm water, um, holding your breath for 10 seconds. I'm, I, I, there's so many, I don't even want to repeat them. Those are the easy ones to some extent to identify. But there are also others which are more difficult to identify. And these are what I call experts because they do appear to be experts because who would not trust a medical doctor to give advice? The problem is that medical doctors are excellent in their field and they are clinically the experts to give that kind of advice. Whereas when it comes to food safety, they are not necessarily the right people to be giving advice on food safety. So I've seen YouTube videos with doc so-called doctors in scrubs, um, washing raw produce in soap and water and telling people to do this. We are not encouraging people to wash raw produce in soap and water. It is one of the things you should not be doing because soap is toxic to human beings and we shouldn't be ingesting soap. We are not designed to do so. It's perfectly adequate to wash raw produce really well with water. Leaving bags of food shopping outside for three days makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. I do understand that the idea is that if you do have plastic packaging, that after three days, the virus will be inactivated. The problem is that if you are buying perishables like fresh milk, um, ice cream, uh, raw meat, fish, etc., there is no way you can keep those bags out for three days. And then there's also deliberate misinterpretation of information that is going around, as well as uh, advice such as washing all raw foods. I've seen this advice, unfortunately, on credible websites uh, from South African um, clinical environments. 
And unfortunately, as I said, they don't understand that, for example, we are saying as food safety experts, do not wash raw chicken in your sink. And many governments are saying that and have been saying that for some time, including the Food Standards Agency of the UK and the FDA in the United States. The reason being that raw chicken may have salmonella or campylobacter on it. And what we don't want is for those salmonella organisms or campylobacters to be distributed in the kitchen sink after washing the raw chicken. Because if you don't wash that chicken sink well and disinfect it well, after washing the raw chicken, you might come with your raw tomato, cucumber and lettuce, wash those, you're going to be cross-contaminating um, from the raw chicken to those fresh vegetables, which you are not going to cook necessarily before consumption. And so you are now picking up Salmonella campylobacter, carrying it over to those fresh veggies, and so people can get ill. So please do not wash your raw chicken in your sink. There's absolutely no need to wash a chicken before you cook it. And the same goes for raw fish and raw meat. And so with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending the webinar over the past five days. I leave the list of resources with you on the last slide, resources I have used, including a number of public health and food safety authorities that you can Google. And the South African Department of Health has put out a website uh, with constant updates, which is very useful at sacoronavirus.co.za that you can go and uh, look at. And you can have a look at my website for constant updates on the virus as well. And you are welcome to email me directly for any questions that you might have. And please follow me on Facebook at analegeconsulting.co.za as well as Twitter at analegeconsult1. And I am also on LinkedIn. And with that, thank you very, very much indeed and have a lovely day. Thank you so much, Prof Professor Annelid, for the webinar you presented to all of us. We all know how much time and effort it takes to prepare for the webinar. Thank you, thank you. Stay healthy, stay safe, and goodbye. Thank you.